Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and after a week layoff, uh, we are going to be back with UFC, and we're going to be analyzing this Saturday's Fight Night card from a DFS perspective. Just as a reminder, tomorrow we're going to be doing our MMA contrarian uh, betting breakdown, which is also quite a bit of fun. But uh, DFS is obviously just a little bit different. We're not really trying to get the best of the lines here. We're trying to use the lines uh, to our in our favor to project fantasy outcome based on those lines. Um, that's kind of a very roundabout way of saying that uh, uh, when you play DFS, you, you usually rely on these lines and these assumptions of props being correct and try to get your edge in, you know, in, in, in fighter projections and, and lineup construction, uh, not necessarily in that order. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, this is that was quite a verbose introduction to this, especially for people that have been here before. Nonetheless, uh, we have an 11 fight card. And first thing is to kind of analyze what this means, right? So an 11 fight card uh, is, is on the short side, to say the least. So what that usually means is that much less of a priority is placed on, on smashing with your, with your selections. In other words, if you can get six winners, it's, it's much more valuable to do that than worry about how they're going to score. Um, because when you have 13, 14 fights, then it's more likely that more underdogs win and you need to actually get like big, huge scores out of it. And that's not to say that we wouldn't prefer, you know, obviously, the higher scoring underdogs, but it's just less important to be really greedy with respect to upside. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, the other thing about the slate that you have to look at is what kind of the top range looks like. In other words, um, whether it becomes a huge priority to get to those high priced fighters, because if it is, then you could probably just, you know, spread out your exposure of different underdogs, even if they don't look that great, because it's just that important to get to those, uh, those high priced favorites. Uh, it was only recently that the, the lowest priced fighter ended up losing and scoring like 13 fantasy points and yet still was in the optimal because you needed that salary savings to get up to those high priced, uh, high priced expensive fighters. So we're going to get to that, but overall it does seem as though the top of the, of the food chain is, is really, really strong. Um, you know, we'll get to Grant Dawson in a little bit, but you know, he's a main event fighter that, you know, it's got five rounds to work with and it's especially suited to his style, which just racks up fantasy points the longer the fight goes. Um, so that's going to be a difficult fade, and it's going to be someone you're probably going to want to get to. And then we're going to get to Pfeiffer and uh, and Drew Dober, guys are pretty high inside the distance lines. And, and Pfeiffer, not Pfeiffer, not only has a strong inside the distance line, but he also might have some takedown upside as well. So these high price fighters are really, really strong. Um, so it means that it's likely that you're going to want to be not as greedy. You know what I mean? To pile on these underdogs you know, with only the upside, you know, you, you, any underdog that you can grab that wins, that'll get you, you know, access to these dudes uh, is, is going to be pretty important. All right. But let's just go through fight by fight because there are only a couple of fighters that I think are just not in play. But before we do that, remember what we're, we're accomplishing here. We're, we're, we're not building lineups. We're just talking about the plays. We're going to get to how these kind of go together maybe a little later on in the video, but these are just going to be kind of who the good plays are. And as you, you know, as we've discussed, just knowing who the good plays are doesn't necessarily mean that that's who you're going to play. You know, if everybody's on the good plays, then you're at best battling for a huge chop uh, when you play those chalky plays, even if they rate to be the most likely to win. But that's leverage, and we'll get into that hopefully. Uh, as we go along. Really sorry for how verbose this all is, but maybe it's from a week week off. I'm just kind of uh, chopping it a bit to get to get into this. Okay, so right off the bat, you have Montella De La Rosa against J.J. Aldridge. And right off the bat, first fight of the night, I think we have a pretty strong play who probably rates to be a pretty decent bit of chalk. So you have Montella De, De La Rosa, who's 8,200 versus 8K. So that implies a, a pick em uh, price tag in the in the in the betting market, and you'll see that De La Rosa is a solid minus one hundred and forty. So first of all, you're getting some pretty decent uh, money line value out of her, 
But not only that, um, her style is very conducive to drafting scoring. She's she's a good wrestler. She's very aggressive. And a lot of her wins in this matchup are going to be due to the fact that she's able to get takedowns. So when you look at her inside the distance line where it's only, you know, uh, plus 350, which is obviously not great, um, the fact that she's going to be going for takedowns and her success in this matchup is predicated on her ability to get them probably makes her an extremely strong play. Um, now on the other side of this, I, I always like to look for the opponent of fighters who look like extremely strong plays, right? because if, if someone looks extremely strong, then they're probably going to be owned. And as a matter of fact, I believe that Bill Rosa is going to be highly owned because everybody's going to see exactly what I just said. So what you're looking for in GPPs is an opponent of an amazing play who happens to also be an okay play. The problem here is it just doesn't look like Aldridge's metrics are good at all. I mean, her inside the distance line is, is hopeless and she doesn't really have takedown upside. The only thing she has going for her is, is leverage. And I don't think leverage is enough. I think you also have to be a somewhat competent play on your own. To, to be a, a decent leverage play. So I think Aldridge herself is going to be, be a fade. Now, the other thing, again, if Aldridge were just an underdog that could access these top, you know, top fight, you know, these top fighters, I might give her a break, but it's not as if she's 7K. She's only 8K. She doesn't really do much for us as far as salary goes. So right off the bat, De La Rosa, uh, De La Rosa very, very strong. I imagine she's going to be popular. So when, when you, when you build your lineups, you know, you got you got to know what contest you're in and, and know what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you play De La Rosa with all the other chalks. That's not going to be a good lineup to play in, say, in, in the Millie Maker, whatever they call it now. It's the other throw, throwdown where you need to beat, you know, 50,000 people. Might still be good enough in cash, might be good enough in even in three max or something like that. But you pair her with, say, we'll get to some others. You pay her, pair her with, with, with Dawson and some of the other obvious plays. Uh, that's probably going to be a, little, be a little too chalky for the big GPP, but make no mistake, she is an extremely strong player. Okay, now we have another uh, uh, mid-range matchup. Uh, you have, uh, what's your name? Uh, Akshuri Lang against Munoz and another 8,200 8K matchup. I didn't, I wasn't aware that they did this. I, I always thought that there was only one pairing within each salary level. I never knew they did this. They had a two eighty two eight thousands, but it is what it is. And I guess the first thing we do is we look at this the the line. And here, the, this line is perfectly balanced. You know, you have uh, a, a Aori, basically a stone pickem, and its price is a stone pickem. So you're not getting any line value there. Um, with respect to the inside the distance lines and the 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 style matchups go. These are both pretty strong. You know, you have uh, inside the distance for Aoris plus 225, which is perfectly reasonable for a pick and price tag. And Munoz is even even better. You know, he's even more likely to finish. So uh, I, I think that both fighters could have some takedown upside. I've seen Aori wrestle and Munoz is a grappler, so I wouldn't be surprised if he gets it on the ground too. So I guess technically Munoz is the better play right? Because he's the cheaper fighter and yet he is as a better inside the distance prop. So I guess the, I guess Munoz is the better play. Um, but both fighters are very, very strong. I mean, you know, any salary saving, you know, is good. So, you know, you play two mid range fighters like this, you're already starting to be in good shape. Like if you can get, you know, one, one good underdog that you like, then you can really get access to, to some of the top guys. All right, we have uh, Murata versus Demopolis, 8,900 versus 7,300. We uh, look at the inside the distance line here, and you have, I mean, a very, very big favorite. You know, she's plus 340. Um, and at 8,900, uh, I mean, you compare that to some of the others, though. I mean, she, she's, she's minus 340. Then you go up to say, you know, uh, Dober at ninety five hundred. He's minus four hundred. Pfeiffer minus four minus four fifty. Dawson minus four fifty. But 
Murata, you are saving a little bit of money on. So I, I think there is a decent amount of, of line, is it okay amount of line value here? Like you would compare her on the other hand to say Buckley, like Buckley is a similar price, I think. He's 87 and he is only um, what you would call it. And Buckley is only, you know, highest 170. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so she does have quite a bit of line value. The only well, the only problem is her her inside the distance line for her for her odds are very poor. You know, her inside the distance prop is about plus three hundred, and at her price, we really need to have more like a plus one twenty. The only thing I would say is that from what I've heard, she does have the the pos the capability of getting a lot of takedowns here. Um, I mean, she hasn't fought in quite some time, so it's kind of unclear what she's going to do. But if she does in fact go for that plan. And it works. Uh, this could be a very, very high score at what could be a very uh, uh, at a pretty reduced ownership. So I feel as though this is, could be my first kind of leveragey type play on the board. That would be Murata. I don't think she's going to be highly owned, um, especially in, 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 the, in the big GPPs. People might get to her maybe in, in, in more cashy type stuff just because her, her win odds are so strong given her price. Um, you know, compared to Buckley and some of the other 87, 8800s. I don't know if people are going to go here with respect to the big GPP. So look for ownerships. And if you can get her under 20%, for example, um, I think that's really strong. And Demopolis, unfortunately, she doesn't win often enough at her price uh, to justify this. And, and not only that, but as I said, Murata is probably going to be low owned, so or lower owned. So you don't get any real leverage with her either. Um, if you look at her inside the distance line, it's like plus 900 or something. So I think Demopolis alongside of Aldridge is, an, is another thing. So I do think Murata, just to kind of summarize, is a good is is a good uh, candidate for this, you know, this throwdown because she's going to be lower owned than other similarly priced priced fighters. And if things go her way, she could put up uh, you know, just as good of a score, if not better than, than all. All right. Um, all right. Um, Matt, Mateus Mendonca versus Nate Maness. So this looks like the first, if I had to guess, I would say this is probably the most popular underdog um, just because it makes so much sense. I mean, you look at him, he's 7,200 and you look at the win odds here and you have, where is it? Where'd he go? Well, actually, maybe not this fight. Sorry. No, there's, there's going to be a better one. But this isn't bad. So you have Mendonca minus, well, minus 250. Nate Maness is plus 200 on the comeback. Yeah, maybe that's not that great now that I think about it. I mean, she, he, but, you know, he's better priced than, better win odds than Demopolis. But then again, he's, he is cheaper than Demopolis as well. We're going to compare him to some of the other underdogs in, in a little bit, but I feel as though th just these win odds at 7,200 at two to one is really not bad. I mean, it's not two to one. It's a little worse than two to one. But the other thing is you look at Manessa's inside the distance line isn't bad, like a plus 350 uh, at 7,200. And I think this is the first so far, you know, actually we haven't really examined too many big underdogs yet. So we'll, we'll compare him, but, we're going to put Manet, Matt uh, Maness in first as a decent punt. Um, just because, you know, plus 350 inside the distance is pretty good. Plus two to one uh, on, on a card where you, you can use some underdogs, I think is pretty good also. I mean, he's a cheaper price than, than Demopolis uh, for openers. We'll compare him a little later to some of the other underdogs. Now, with respect to Mendonca, he's 9K. So at 9K, you really need an inside the distance line of, of minus, you know, hopefully minus 110 or better. And it's only plus one. Well, here it's plus 135, but here it's minus 138. So I guess it's fair. I mean, I, I guess both sides of this fight are, are in play. Um, so Mendonca and Manes are both going to be in play here. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Carolina Kovalkiewicz versus Diana Belbita. 8,600 versus 7,600. 
first again, we'll look at the win odds here. You have Kobukevich is minus, she's only minus 150. I mean, that's not particularly great for this win odds. It's not bad, but they'll beat at 7,600 plus 130. And that's like pretty reasonable. You know, and you look at her inside the distance. Let's look at both the inside the distance line. Kovalkiewicz inside the distance is plus 700. She doesn't really have takedown upside, really. So this is this is poor. They'll beat it inside the distance plus 550. That's no bargain either, though. The only thing that makes her a play, though, is just, again, because she is an underdog with a decent chance to win. You know, and on some slates, that's not enough. On this slate, it is, you know, because, again, you really want to get to some of those high-priced dudes. And, and and any underdog with a reasonable chance to win is going to be in your pool. So I do like Belbita as well. So Belbita and Manus are, 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 are decent. And Kovalke, which, again, is another uh, – seems like another another fade here. So, unfortunately, we, I'm not to be sexist, but so far we have one, two, three full fades, and they're all women fighters. Um, and there's a reason for that. They usually don't have great, you know – an upside. You usually don't have great strong inside the distance lines. Um, so Aldrich, Demopolis, and Kobo K, which are probably going to fade. All right. Uh, another mid range fight. You have a couple of these uh, Kutalaba versus Philippe Linz. Kutalaba, 8,300 versus 7,900. We're expecting to see, I don't know, minus 130 or so on Kutalaba. And what are we getting? Like minus 150, so a little bit better. It's getting a little bit, a tiny bit of win odds here. But the real deal is that Kutalaba, his inside the distance line is super duper strong. Like he's minus 120. And that's what we're going to need from a 90, a 9,000 and up fighter. So this is like, this is like a ridiculously strong play. So again, the first thing we do when we identify a ridiculously strong play is see if the other side is an okay play. Because if the other side is an okay play, that's going to be a pretty strong piece of leverage. And, and I have to say that Linz at plus 220 inside the distance at 7,900, it's really not bad. And considering he's going to get a little bit of leverage over Kudalaba, because I have to imagine this is going to be that Kudalaba is going to be pretty chalky, right? I mean, with this inside the distance line. Um, so with that said, I think Linz is a pretty good bit of leverage in, uh, in, uh, in GPPs. Now you want a little trick? So here, here's something you can do. And this is, this is, I, I think this is pretty sneaky. If you want to play Philip Linz, Philippe Linz, and especially in like MMEs, what I encourage that you do is you leave 400 on the table reason for that is because people that run 150 and run optimals if they have 8300 left those lineups unless they've like intentionally left money on the table are going to be forcing in more uh, just a lot of kutalaba okay so in that exact lineup for you to have lins where an optimizer would have given you kutalaba gives you a little bit of extra leverage and a little bit of extra, uh, a, a little less duplication in your lineup. So I think that's a really, really strong way to play. I haven't quite figured out how to, how to code that. I mean, you can, you know, but it, it's, it's actually trickier than you think, you know, to say, you know, all Linz lineups leave 400 on the table. Like it's not exactly that easy, um, but that is definitely something you can consider. Bill Algio versus Anthony Hernandez, Alex Hernandez, and and boy oh boy, you know for an eleven fight card, there's a lot, there's very few, very few tosses here. Here's another mid range matchup, which is very interesting. You know, you, you have 8,400, 7,800 here, and I imagine you're going to get again, again, get about a minus one fifty on uh, Algio. Matter of fact, this line's pretty bad. You know, at only minus one thirty. Like compare him. He's minus 130 and Kutalab is minus 150 and Kutalab is cheaper. So Algio is actually a little, little bit of poor line value. If anything, there might be a little bit of line value in Hernandez, like at, at 7,800. 
Um, he's only like a plus 105. So at 7,800, there's actually like some line value in him. Uh, and you look at the inside the distance line, I think they're both very similar, both about plus 200. Is that right? Let's see. Algio inside the distance, about plus 250. Hernandez, plus 250. So again, this is like the Munoz fight, right? Hernandez is, is cheaper and more likely to get the finish. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I think Hernandez is probably going to be the stronger play. Uh, but I mean, there's no dispute that Algio at, at that inside the distance line, that's actually not bad and he'll get there in 150 max, whatever. But I do think Hernandez is the better, is the better, you know, DFS play. All right. Drew Dober, Drew Dober versus Ricky Glenn. Um, Drew Dober, 9,500 versus 6,700. This is one of those minus 400 favorites that we kind of alluded to earlier. And, you know, at this price, you're going to need a lot. That's the thing. Like at 9,500, you're going to need a first round KO. Um, maybe even more than that. You know, like if, if you just get a regular old first round KO after like three minutes and you score 100, I mean, look, you have a better chance of that being good enough on an 11 fight card. That's the only thing. Um, but if this goes to two rounds, I mean, you're going to need like knockdowns, which is kind of tough to project. Um, so Dober's inside the distance line for openers is, what is this? I mean, it's Dober inside the distance. I mean, it's minus 175, which is just really good. But what is he inside the first round? Let's see. Actually, this is pretty strong. It's plus 150 inside the first round. We're looking for like maybe like plus 200. So, um, yeah, I, I think this is this is a good play. Um, you can only hope that he doesn't get as much ownership because of his price. And I happen to think he is going to be a little lower owned than this, his metrics might suggest, only because of how ridiculous a play Grant Dawson looks. And it's just tough to get 295, 9400s in. Um, and Pfeiffer's a good play, too. I don't know how Dober can get like that much ownership let's put it that way so as a result of that i'm not as inclined to take that shot on ricky glenn in in dfs um you know he's plus 300 to win what's his inside the distance line um actually if he wins i don't really care too much about the inside the distance line um but uh I mean, I'll get to him in 150, and I thought about this. You know, I, I, if I knew that Dober was going to be like the, the uber chalk, I would take a shot um, on an 11 fight card like this. But I'm going to save my Glenn exposure, I think, for my for my betting, which we're going to get to a little later. But in DFS, I just don't think it's worth it. All right, Alex Morono versus Joaquin Buckley. I alluded to this fight before. So you have Buckley as a minus 170. And his price is, you know, pretty healthy for that, for that, for those win odds. You know, we talked about, what's his name? What's her name? Uh, well, Mendo uh, Mendonca. He's only a hundred, you know, 300 more. You have, uh, what's his name? Who is the 8,900? Uh, the, the woman fighter. Oh, uh, Murata 8,900 with much better win odds than Buckley. But let's see if we can't make that up in, in, in his metrics. And I think you can. If I'm not mistaken, he's about a minus 110 to finish. And that's really good for this price tag. So I think this is really strong. And and Morono, just for his win odds, you know, he's going to win the fight about 40%, you know, 40 of the time. And again, we're looking to get to get underdogs in there at only 7,500. You know, imagine you have something like this. I mean, th these these are the fighters like that. I kind of where's De La Rosa? De La Rosa. I mean, these are all very reasonably priced fighters that can get you. I mean, this leaves three thousand on the table. We don't need to do, to do this, but but you can get rid of any two of these, and you could start building with these big price guys. You know, um, but yeah, Morono and Buckley both. Both pretty good.
Uh, okay, uh, Pfeiffer versus Al Razak Hassan. So he's 9,300. He's again minus 400 or so. Um, actually, only minus 300. No, no, he's minus 500. Actually, minus 400. And again, for that price, he's actually cheaper than Dober. And what he has going for him is not only, I believe, a very strong inside the distance line, which is, let's see, well, first of all, Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer round one plus 108. Huh? What's he inside the distance? Minus 250. And then plus 100. I mean, this is, plus he's got takedown upside. This is like a lock. You know what I mean? Like, this is an amazing play. Um, this is so much of a better play than Dober. So what does that mean? Okay, so if this is so much of a better play than Dober, it means a couple of things. Number one, Pfeiffer's got to be higher. He just has to be. Which means, okay, that in the lineups that double spend, you're probably going to get a lot of Pfeiffer-Dawson, which means that we can really look at Razak Al-Hassan as leverage as opposed to Dober's opponent, uh, as opposed to Glenn, because Pfeiffer is just forced to be higher on. I mean, just look at that. Look at how awesome he looks as a play. And I'm not disputing that he's a good player, but when you're trying to figure what underdog to take, take a shot on, I mean, Al-Hassan is going to be much higher leverage than, than I believe, than, uh, than Glenn. So Al-Hassan, problem is, I mean, let's, let's look at this. Inside the distance, I mean, what is this, like plus 1,000? We'll, we'll deal with that in the betting, I guess, because I, I do think that if he wins, he's got a much better chance to get a finish than, pe than his lines are implying here. Um, but according to these lines, it's really not going to get a finish too often, which means you're, you're dealing with someone who's plus just plus 300 or plus you know 20% to win. Um, but I do think that he is a, a better punt, I'll put it this way, than, um, than Glenn. Um but Pfeiffer is just a super, super play here. So, and then you get to the main event. I've kind of alluded to this before. You have Grant Dawson, who's minus 400. And the style matchup is just pretty brutal here. You have Bobby Green, who really can't defend takedowns all that well. And this is what all Dawson does. And you have five rounds to amass all these DraftKings points. I mean, he legitimately can get 150 here. Um, I mean, as a matter of fact, like, like you talk about win conditions. Like, if he wins... But what's the least amount he can score in a win, Dawson? I think the least amount he can score in a win is probably 100. And those are maybe that's the variation where he gets, say, a third round finish with maybe three takedowns, something like that, or four. Three, take, three takedowns, third round win. I guess you don't, I think, guess that's, that's his floor in a win. Obviously, if it's a first round win with a takedown submission, that's over 100, maybe 110. Second round, again, it's going to be over 100. Third round, we mentioned. Once you get into the fourth and fifth round, you've just been amassing so many wrestling points that it's just hard to not smash. And God forbid this goes to a decision. I mean, you're talking about eight takedowns or five takedowns and, you know, Winning five minutes of control time or something like that. I mean, it's it's uh you can't obviously have 25 minutes of control time, but you can have 15 minutes of control time in this fight. And you can get 150 points out of Dawson here. So I mean he is the best play. So what that means is that we gotta really consider the Bobby Green side, right? Because listen, it it just looks impossible, right? Because you look at the at the uh, at the style matchup, and you just can't help but just see it, right? Dawson gets the takedowns, and he wins. That you know, just is. But it's just it's just not like that. I mean, that's not the way math works. And the way math works is that based on these odds, Bobby Green wins the fight. What about twenty five percent of the time, something like that. And what is he scoring a win? Um, I, I don't know. But but I promise you this, that, that Grant Dawson's going to be forty percent plus owned, and I, I don't care what Bobby Green scores in a win in a situation like that. So this is uh, this is gross, but you just got to play him, right? There's just way too much leverage 
against a 40%, 50% owned guy to not play him. So, uh, yeah. So, unfortunately, we've gone through 22 fighters, and if I really like 19 of them, I, okay, but let's, let's, let's see if we can't review and, and, and cut things out a little bit. Okay, so right off the bat, De La Rosa's good. We don't like J.J. Aldridge. That's one thing. Uh, Maness, Mendoza, I think both sides look good, I have to say. Murata, pretty, pretty decent amount of leverage there. So I won't get to her in three or 20 mats, but in 150, you just have to do this. Demopolis, no. I do like Munoz a little better than Ayori. I guess that's helpful. Uh, Kovic, don't like her. Fade her. Belbita, she's just going to have to show up in some lineups where you, where you double pay up. You're just going to have to. Um, I don't think she's a priority play or anything like that, so I guess that's helpful. I do like Hernandez a little better than Algio. I guess that might help. Uh, Kutalaba, according to the metrics, might be the best play on the board, with the exception of maybe Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer which means that Lins is probably a decent amount of leverage. Uh, Dober Glenn, okay, we could we don't have to play Glenn. and Dober looks fine, but... No, I just it's just so hard for me to get to him instead of Pfeiffer, if you want to know the truth. But he's gonna be lower owned, so I don't know. Not I'm not doing it three max, not doing it in 20 max, honestly. I'd rather just get up to Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer there. Uh Buckley Morono, I think, is a, is 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 pretty fair. Um I have no problem with either of them. I talked about Pfeiffer and Al Hassan. Um Al Hassan's a better bit of leverage than say Ricky Glenn, I mentioned before. And uh, Dawson's obviously an amazing play. And Bobby Green, because of that, just has to be decent leverage. So this is going to be a tough one. You know, I mean, look, I, I've already shown you like, a couple lines you can make. Like, you play any of these guys and get rid of him and play any of these these top guys. You just, I can't give you a full lineup, but like something like this is going to be really easy to play. So the point is, is that, if you're going to play three max and 20 max, you can play fairly good lineups really easily. When you get into the one fifties and in the throwdown and stuff like that, you're going to have to do some funny business, which means, you know, does that mean you have to play Koval K bitch? I mean, that, 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 that's a, listen, there are two, there are two, well, many schools of thought, but two main schools of thoughts on this. Like if you know that, like say Demopolis is a bad play, and you know that Kovalkiewicz is a bad play. And you know that Aldrich is a bad play. For example, do you play them anyway because it's 150 you need to get different? Or do you use those lineups that you would have played them to build other combinations of other fighters? And that's, that's therein lies the problem. Uh, therein lies, the, if I knew the answer to that specifically, I would have solved DFS pretty much. Um, but, you know, you listen, you could use the Saber Sim contest sims to help you uh, figure out the answer to that. You can leave money on the table in a way that I described earlier when you're playing the underdogs. You could set lineup uh, build constructions where you do a maximum ownership or anything, something like that. There are ways you can come up with the answer to that dilemma. I'm inclined to just fade those on a card like this. There's just so many other options that make sense. That I just don't need like an Aldrich, I don't believe Demopolis Kovalkiewicz lineup or even either of them, any of them, because there are 19 other fighters. I just think there are combinations in there that I would rather get to be different than the ones with the the the, the worst plays. Um, okay, that will do it. Uh, stay tuned for the uh, betting breakdown, which will come tomorrow. Uh, uh, pretty cool slate.